This last session is to better understand how behavioral science can contribute to communications that can change behaviors. And so the first portion of the session is a short conversation with Mikhail Natan. And Mikhail has served as the managing director of the French government's information service since 2018. Mikhail is an expert in marketing, digital communications, working with some of the leading companies of media, entertainment, luxury software. He's been at Warner Brothers. He's been at LVMH. He's been at uh, Deso System. So welcome, Mikhail. This conversation will be in French. You can listen to simultaneous translation in English. Post any of your questions in English or French into the chat. After you. Merci, Ted. Thank you, Ted. So, Ted, uh, just uh, uh, made a brief introduction to remind us that you have a very, uh, you had a very special career before you became, uh, before you were put in charge of the French government's information service, the SIG. So, what is its mission, and what is your vision? of uh, government communications, because you obviously joined in 2018 uh, in the midst of a couple of uh, issues where communication is crucial. Well, first of all, thanks a lot for your invitation. I'm uh, truly delighted to be here. Uh, as you said, I've had a, the first part of my career was in the private sector. This is my first foray into the public sector. Uh, but I've been there for a while now, almost four years, so I'm not really a newcomer. And uh, I worked for large groups in French and global companies, uh, essentially in marketing, and uh, with a background in digital and in transformation. And that is uh, uh, the circumstances under which I came to the SIG to transform Le service d'information du gouvernement, qu'est-ce que c'est C'est une administration qui est rattachée uh, au premier ministre ou à la première ministre, uh, en l'occurrence, uh, dans la fonction... Uh, Comme son nom ne l'indique pas, uh, which le service d'information du gouvernement, uh, c'est de faire de la communication. Uh, de faire de la communication pour faire quoi service. Effectivement, de faire de la communication pour faire de l'information et, et de faire en sorte que cette information soit sure la plus impactante possible. C'était d'ailleurs deux objectifs quand je suis arrivé, uh, de faire uh, du, de, de faire en sorte de moderniser, transformer cette communication sure pour, uh, pour, pour, pour que, que l'information au service du plus grand nombre sure uh, soit information plus for the et number plus efficace. Alors, and has le SIG, uh, je vous ai dit, so c'est une administration qui est rattachée à la première ministre, is, uh, qui a en fait uh, finalement trois objectifs majeurs. Elle a trois objectifs majeurs. Major missions. Uh, first, analysis and understanding data of data. Second, it manufactures communication assets, as a lot of people know how to do, communication tools uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, editorial content, video content, uh, artwork, everything that uh, normal communications uh, include. And our third activity is to coordinate the action of different ministries, because SIG means government information service, and there can only be government communication if there is coordination between different ministries. And we invested, uh, we've put a lot of time and effort into that, particularly during the COVID crisis. Okay, so we'll talk about um, the crisis phases, but could you tell us how uh, you discovered behavioral sciences? Un jour, j'ai rencontré Eric Singler. Et il well, I met ça. Eric Singler. Enfin, no, je, je... it wasn't that actually. <laughs> en fait, comme je vous dit, uh, as a matter of fact, je suis issu donc plutôt d'un environnement I come from et je crois que ça a été marketing background. Dans and I think uh, you marketing, may have understood that from the previous presentation. What we do is to take an interest in behaviors, understand these behaviors, and try to action these behaviors in the positive sense. And of course, when you're in marketing for entertainment or consumer products. Or, or B2C, but also for B2B, you need to understand and anticipate behaviors in order to better optimize, say, a lead, a lead a sales funnel, or leads, or so on. Um, so that's my mindset as I come along. So when I'm asked, when I joined, 
Uh, they asked me for a roadmap, and I didn't really know how all of this worked. So I tried comparables, I benchmarked uh, the old habits, hard to kick. And so there was the private sector that I could use to benchmark, so I looked at marketing organizations, found inspiration there, and there were also competitors. And in, in the institutional sphere, it means other governments, particularly uh, in the Anglo-Saxon world, who started before us, as usual, as often. And uh, uh, that's just a fact. So I looked at how the UK, uh, the US and Australia worked. And uh, also what newcomers did. I'm thinking about Estonia or Singapore, uh, who are e-governments by design in a sense, and who've really factored in uh, dimensions of uh, behavioral sciences to better target information to their citizens. So that is ultimately how I uh, discovered uh, the application of behavioral sciences into the institutional sphere. Okay, so we're now going to talk about one of the issues that kept you probably a little bit busy for a while, the COVID crisis, because prior to the vaccine, the manner in which people were trying to protect themselves was by encouraging uh, uh, these uh, health measures and then vaccination. And the SIG's job uh, was uh, crucial was a crucial element of government action. Could you tell us a little bit more about how you sought to encourage these uh, positive behaviors in individuals um, in the broader community, say from March 2020 to, uh, into 2021? Well, the interesting thing about the succession of crises that we faced, and of course, uh, uh, COVID was a climax in that. Uh, I'm just post-rationalizing this, and it's probably a manner uh, for me to make it more acceptable because it required huge work uh, from all of us within SIG. But these were accelerators of transformation. Particularly, they uh, allowed a change of paradigm in the manner in which communication was integrated at the heart of crisis management. So there were a number of crises, uh, the yellow vest, the national debate, um, smaller, more localized crises. I'm thinking about Lubrizol, for instance, that kept us very busy. Uh, that required a lot of uh, reflections about uh, the place of communications. And I think what happened there was really a very deep change. It's really a before and an after on the positioning of communication in crisis management. Communication, uh, for a great many uh, consumer brands, is strategic. Uh, and it's also strategic in a, in a policy-making environment, but we actually changed its position, its standing, uh, notably in terms of supporting uh, behavioral change. Of course, I'm not going to remind you of uh, uh, some bad memories, but remember those days when we start announcing things that we never thought we would have been announcing, and that required uh, communication. Uh, if you look at issues uh, such as the uh, the so-called barrier gestures and, uh, and uh, the lockdowns, that requires a lot of communication. So there's going to be explanation uh, for people to embrace these measures, and then there also needs to be education in terms of these new behaviors that were now recommended or mandatory, and then uh, things that were very simple about the next steps and so on. I'm thinking, of course, about the vaccine. And it was a very interesting moment because uh, we looked at behavioral science uh, to work uh, on vaccination, on these uh, so-called barrier gestures. But we also really needed to keep up the momentum and uh, that's the essence of communication, conveying messages of mobilization or of uh, let's just hang in there together. Uh, we use that a lot, tenir ensemble. Uh, we'll pull through together. So COVID is both uh, 
a phase when we used behavioral science, but where we also had more conventional communication around ideas of uh, collective mobilization and the fact that uh, we needed to resist, to pull through. So in terms of uh, the nudge approach and behavioralism, how did you try to leverage uh, these concepts in everything that you did? Well, we worked with multiple partners, so I don't know if uh, it, it's a well-known fact, but there's in the DITP, uh, the uh, Directorate of Public Transformation, which uh, has integrated aspects of uh, behavioral sciences. So we're not, we don't quite yet have a nudge unit uh, like people do in Britain, but we, that is being factored in. And we also worked a lot with academia. The SIG had an expert committee at one point. We worked with uh, the Normal Soup lab that uh, was conducting research on that. And also with an nudge unit at BVA who helped us with these issues uh, to allow us to to work on a number of issues. So perhaps we could uh, talk about a couple of key moments. I'd say that initially the first step we needed to address, uh, we needed to think long and hard about that. We looked for solutions based on behavioral sciences. Uh, there was the very start, basically the first lockdown. It was almost a contradictory injunction. Stay at home on the one hand, uh, you were forced to stay at home. And on the other hand, uh, there needed to be people who continued to go to work. Uh, the front line, the first and second line workers, not just the healthcare workers. And so we thought, how can we support the message that it can't be identified as being a kind of paradoxical, contradictory injunction? And that's where we worked with behavioral sciences, how we could work on these changes of behavior. And the second moment, uh, those were kind of mini nudges more, uh, more anecdotal perhaps. There was a, a, a kind of a drift in society over the period of the crisis. Everyone became an epidemiologist, a great medical specialist. We all read the data and interpreted us, but it also meant that the institutions and governments needed to be entirely transparent. But even with that transparency, we had to find these little facilitators to help to elicit data, uh, the proper triggers to try and interpret evolutions in the pandemic. Uh, and that was more in the digital world, it was more uh, support that was provided on uh, to make sure that the uh, dashboard, the daily dashboard, was as legible as possible. So that was the second phase. And then the third phase, um, it's more um, social marketing that's at stake there. Uh, you may know that there's an experience on the government side uh, in social marketing and uh, supporting behavioral changes. Of course, there are two key players. There's uh, road safety and uh, Santé Publique France. Uh, we've all forgotten, but uh, when uh, wearing a seat belt became mandatory, there was, there was a lot of resistance. Well, there was support also on other epidemics during uh, AIDS or uh, other uh, STDs or STIs. But then on the uh, in terms of the reflection and the support that could be provided um, to allow people to accept and embrace these proposals, particularly the, the proposal of the vaccine, uh, we used uh, the social marketing uh, aspects a lot. And another part in which we used nudges or behavioral sciences more broadly was uh, something that uh, in fact, we, there, there was a finding that we had initially. We thought there was a semantic, a basic semantic error. I'll tell you the story. It was the word confinement, confinement. Everyone started using the word all the time. 
everyone was an epidemiologist and everyone knew uh, so there was confinement deconfinement unconfinement and so on and the important thing was that we gave that word a particular meaning the meaning of the first moment so confinement means lockdown you can stay at home and you have this a piece of paper and you can leave home uh, once a day and you you're with your family and you live normally with your family but at home and then there was uh, that moment when people uh, caught the disease and when they tested positive, positive they also had to self-confine, self-isolate. But confinement doesn't uh, mean uh, the same thing as before. It means not eating together, but sleeping in a separate room. So the word confinement was used twice. And then we thought, so, okay, how are we going to explain that? It was pretty advanced, and we saw that we were losing control. So we had to find a moment. And that's where we uh, had the idea of contextual communication where you have these rapid antigen tests. At first you couldn't do them at home, you had to go to a lab uh, or a pharmacy. And there was a little bit of a delay between the moment when uh, the test is done and where you know the results. And these five minutes there, so during these five minutes we need to convey all of the message. So basically when you were tested, you were handed out a leaflet about what you could do. If you're negative, this is what you do. If you're positive, what you do. No guilt, no anxiety, just simple, clear explanations to address that. So four situations during COVID, during which we leveraged behavioral science to um, uh, optimize our communications. Okay, great. So the... Uh, crisis, uh, there are a number of other crises uh, on the horizon. Uh, could you tell us about your priorities for the future, uh, by which I mean tomorrow morning? Well, there, there are plenty of things to do, of course. I won't uh, tell you about um, energy uh, sobriety, for instance. But if I look at what the SIG's mission is, what we're trying to, and what we're trying to do, the big challenge for us is to make government communication understandable and impactful. So, in fact, there's a kind of dual time frame. There's uh, the short term and the medium and long term. Uh, the short term mission, which is our top mission, is to increase visibility of the government's action. Uh, on a daily basis. That addresses very simple issues uh, for a very long time. Government communication or political communications uh, was uh, performative. It would just, uh, it was there, people would see it. But now, whatever the issuer of the message, uh, whoever they are, ministers, president or so on, the, um, when they talk, basically what they say stays around for 24 hours and then it's forgotten, something else replaces it. So we have to work on a, on a sequenced approach or repetition. We need to repeat things constantly. And therefore we need to increase the visibility of the government's action on the other hand, we also need to increase the legibility of public policies, uh, name, uh, meaning the results of uh, government policies. There's the political promise, then there's the discourse, and then there's the results. And the results need to be made more legible. The results of the great national debate was that people said they do not know what the state is doing for them. So. Public policies need to be made more visible, people need to know that they exist, and they also need to be understandable uh, in terms of their effects on individual citizens. And third objective we have, of course this is a government, but it's the same uh, in any organization, we need to build our skills uh, and uh, retain talents and so on. So really to kind of uh, modify this uh, pretty broad ecosystem uh, to make it more professional and more efficient and typically more 
responsive or at least more open to new tools, be they digital or behavioral. Okay, a, a final question, because I think that we're uh, running out of time now. Um, but the question that was kind of my guiding thread all day today, and that will also be tomorrow, as an expert in communications and marketing and digital, uh, what advice would you give, uh, say, a uh, chief communications officer who would like to start leveraging behavioral sciences in their work? Well, back to basics, one of the first things is don't be self-focused, don't be uh, me user-centric, uh, the users being citizens when you're um, when you're a government or consumers when you, you're in FMCG. Um, you need to be open, you need to look outwards. And you need to work bottom up from the expression of, of what people are saying and use that through behavioral science. Use these key learnings to develop strategies. That would be the first point. The second point is the behavioral sciences is all at once behaviors, usages on which we want to have an influence in terms of uh, marketing or communication. But these behaviors can also be used to better understand, and that's the scientific approach at, uh, at SIG. And that's something I would really recommend. Understand. Don't be too empirical. Don't just have an intuition that that's what you need to do, which is why all of the analysis conducted at SIG, we have people who analyze what's going on through opinion polls, uh, what's happening on social media, in the media. Uh, and that's very useful to build communication approaches uh, that are not purely empirical, but are more object ob ob objective. So, be focused on the target, be scientific in your approach, use insights to build communication strategies. Uh, in, in the public sector, we use a lot of data, including opinion polls, but also uh, data from social media and uh, conventional media. And I think for the brands, it's the same thing. They're taking very keen interest in all of that, in that huge uh, pool of resources. Thank you very much, Mikael. Uh, perhaps we have time for a couple of questions for Mikael. Uh, do we have any questions on social media? It must be essentially our friends in the US. Our friends in Asia, um, I hope, have gone to bed. Uh, do we have questions in the room? Otherwise, I, do, I personally have a couple. Maybe we could give uh, this person a microphone. The question's off mic. So, I've been asked to repeat the question uh, for our friends who are listening online. It was a question about trust or mistrust uh, in governments. How to address that? I think the first thing to do is to acknowledge that it exists. Uh, I talked very briefly about the fact that the SIG now has a scientific committee with uh, people uh, who are not directly involved in government, and we drafted a report with them called uh, the Confidence Shock. All of this idea that we really do need to be aware that there is uh, that that defiance exists. And the uh, second thing that I could illustrate with a very concrete example, what we did with France Relance, is that just saying things, 
or just announcing something, the announcement is really not in itself sufficient. You always need to demonstrate. Uh, with the France Relance plan, which was a recovery plan, 100 billion euros uh, dedicated uh, after the phase one of COVID to reboot the economy. And just after the launch, or just before, I can't quite remember, uh, there was, we conducted a little survey and there was a verbatim that said this France Relance plan is a financial plan to save the economy. So basically, there's uh, these hundred billions, we don't know what it means, we don't know where they're going. Uh, it's going to save the economy, so it's probably going to serve big business. So all of the parameters were there to make sure that, uh, uh, that it would fail. So what we did was try to demonstrate what it actually meant in very real terms. Uh, the achievements through the, plan, the France Relance plan with the resources dedicated. So I don't know if people uh, if it re-established trust, but it certainly allowed people to uh, allow things to be more concrete, to materialize, so to speak, that things become tangible and uh, understandable individually. Individually, it can be a person, uh, a local government, an organization, various levels, or, uh, that, that it could be materialized. And then restoring trust or creating trust is, of course, uh, something that needs uh, to come from policymakers, from the general public, and not just from institutional communication. Other questions before mine? Well, uh, I'll have the honor of asking the final question here. What does the Michael Nathan of 2002 uh, no, of 2022, I mean. Well, between 20... <laughs> well, you were probably not, not as good as uh, communications in, twen in 2002. Oh, so what have I learned? Um, I'll say... I'd say that in terms of power... Nothing's more powerful than the state in uh, putting through messages. It's incredible. All Any private or public sector uh, actor tries to maximize the impact. Uh, they're going to, they're, they're going to uh, buy, uh, you know, buy uh, a media space or do digital, and then there's the last mile, how do they reach the uh, final target. But when you think about what the state is, there's nothing more granular or structured. And if you can action that uh, sounding chamber, you're in a configuration where you have something extremely powerful in your hands. But then how do you action it properly? How do you operate it properly? How do you understand all of the different dimensions in there? And of course, I was a beginner in, in 2018, so there was a bit of a learning curve. Uh, but it's uh, all of these learnings are, I'll have taught me a lot. I don't know where I'll be working tomorrow, but I'm sure it'll be useful in future. Thank you very much, Mikael. So, our second conversation about communications, this will end our communication session and end the first day at the Human Advantage, is with Professor Jonah Berger from the Wharton School. He'll be interviewed by our colleague Richard Chataway, who's the CEO at the BVA Nudge Consulting in the UK. Our last conversation, it's a bit of a quick one. Stick around and that'll be the end of the today. Thank you. Thank you. Hi everyone. I am uh, honored to introduce our guest speaker for the communication session at the Human Advantage Conference. Today, I am with my uh, colleague, Richard Chataway, who is the uh, CEO of BVA Nudge Consulting UK, the author of a wonderful book, The Behavior Business, and also one of the BVA family champions for communication. And now we are joined by Professor Jonah Berger, marketing professor at the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania and internationally best-selling author of three books that I have loved personally, Contagious, Invisible Influence and The Catalyst. Dr. Berger is a world-renowned expert on change, word of mouth, 
influence, consumer behavior, and how product ideas and behavior catch on. He has published, I think, over 50 articles in top-tier academic journals, teach Wharton's highest rated online course and popular outlets like the New York Times and Harvard Business Review often uh, cover his work. So a lot. He's keynoted hundreds of events, including our events, and often consult for organizations like Google, Apple, Nike, and the Gates Foundation. So welcome, Jonah, to the Human Advantage Conference. Hi, Jenna. Thanks uh, for joining us. And it's a great pleasure to, to have you here today. Um, first of all, I guess I wanted to ask uh, you about uh, why things catch on or, or go viral. Um, I guess it's something that all of us who work in communications are, are, are a bit obsessed with and we all want to achieve, but but very rarely do. Um, in your in your book, Contagious, which, like Eric, I, I thought was brilliant, um, you, you outline six principles that make, uh, that make things become popular. Um, I guess since 2013 when the book came out, there's been a kind of explosion in available channels uh, for us in communications, especially in social media. Uh, I guess, how uh, could you tell us how that's changed or shaped your thinking on, on how things become popular? Yeah, you know, I think um, when the book came out, uh, people often ask me, oh, why didn't you write about all the most recent examples of why things went viral? So there was a, you know, there was a New York Times review, I think, that said, oh, he doesn't talk about the Harlem Shake or whatever it is. Um, and my goal in writing the book wasn't actually to talk about the most recent examples uh, of things that caught on, went viral, or got word of mouth. My goal was to have kind of framework of what drives people to talk uh, and share. Um, and I think my favorite books are the books that five, 10, 15 years later, even after they come out, are equally good uh, as when they came out initially. Um, and timeless examples actually are a lot more important than uh, most recent examples, because a lot of examples may be recent, uh, 10 years later, it's not going to be. And so, um, you know, I think the good news is uh, because the because contagion is about why people share, not what they share, um, many of those reasons haven't changed. You know, the psychology of why we talk about things, why we share things, why we pass them on with friends, you know, that's not new. I didn't invent that, right? That's been happening for thousands of, of years. Um, uh, you know, cavemen and women shared things with one another. Um, uh, you know, hundreds of years ago, people shared things with one another. And so the motivations to look good, uh, to share things that are top of mind, um, you know, the fact that emotions drive sharing, all of that is is ancient and not new. Um, and so even though the channels we change have changed that we share things through, the motivations have not. Um, and so I think much has stayed the same. What I will say, though, is on the margin, there there have been some changes or, or shifts, right? So um, if you look, there's certainly been more of a shift online. Now, so most word of mouth is offline. Um, you know, when I wrote the book, only about 7 to 10% of all word of mouth uh, is online. Now it's edging closer to 12 or 15%, but it's still we're near the 60 or 70% that we might think. Um, and so online is become more, uh, more important. Um, I also think some of the motives uh, for sharing on the margin of change, right? What things we might be triggered by uh, in the environment have shifted. Um, the dynamics of platforms have shifted a bit. But those six key steps, you know, social currency triggers, motion, public, practical value, and stories, those were the same before I wrote the book. They're the same uh, when the book came out, and, and they haven't changed. How we apply you know, as a as communications professional, as a marketing professional, how we apply those principles may have shifted a little bit based on the environment that we're dealing with. But the principles themselves, the motivations have, have stayed very much. That's really interesting. Yeah, that I'd, um, I think that's, that's a, a really important point to remember that, you know, I guess evolution doesn't work that fast, that, that we as people don't, haven't fundamentally changed over the course of the last 10 years um, and, and our motivations accordingly. And I guess with that in mind, one one sort of challenge that we sometimes get from clients, I guess, is that, you know, we, we talk about, for example, you know, our current circumstances and the current context in which we live and the kind of post-COVID world, um, for example. Um and and you know and and therefore you know has has COVID for example changed us and how the way we can influence people uh, changed? Um, do you think is there any impact specifically around COVID and the impact that's had on the world over the last couple of years that's, that's kind of shaped your thinking on that and 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 how 
how we can make things go viral. Yeah, I mean, I think one thing that COVID has done is it's forced us all to change, right? Working mm -hmm. from home, ordering things online. And now as we come out, hopefully out or move out towards out of COVID, or at least a little bit out of COVID, mm -hmm. I think we have the opportunity now to sit back and say, well, which of these things do we want to keep? And which one of these things do we want to go back to normal? Um, uh, you know, uh, I think many companies said, oh, we'll work from home uh, because we have to. And now some companies said, oh, we need to be back in the office because we have to. Well, why do we have to? It is it actually the best way for people to work? For some jobs and some parts of some jobs, certainly it's definitely the best place. For other parts of other jobs, it may not be the best place. For some jobs, being back in the office may have no value. It may actually be better for the company to allow people to work remotely because you can get a better workforce and they're happier and they can spend more time because they don't have to have an hour and a half commute each way. And so I think what smart companies are doing is not thinking about what they have to do, but the opportunities that COVID have provided uh, us, um, the learnings we can gain from these shifts in consumer and customer behavior and what we should do as a result. Same with, um, you know, digital marketing, same with, um, uh, you know, selling people online rather than physical stores. What are stores good for? Should we get rid of stores? No, but do we need stores? Right? What do stores add above and beyond digital? What are they good at? What are they not good at? And how can we use that to be more effective? And I think that's what smart companies are doing. Mm, it's really interesting because I think um, if you think of, um, I guess, you know, we, uh, there's been a lot of talk and certainly clients that we speak to about um, digital transformation and we help them with a lot of challenges around that. And, and what's been interesting, I guess, uh, our experience with that in COVID is the, that it's just accelerated existing trends, I guess, if you see what I mean. Um, and I guess, you know, it, it, it kind of works both ways, doesn't it? Because obviously we're seeing companies like Amazon are opening physical stores <laughs> um, and, and moving you back into that world. So it's, 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 it's um, uh, it, it, you know, it's not necessarily one way, um, one way traffic in, in that sense. Um, yeah, and I think smart companies think about well, what I have a store. What is a store for? Digital is important. Yes. Mm -hmm. And maybe, Jonah, uh, um, you mentioned that things have not evolved so rapidly since the launch of uh, Contagious. Uh, so, could you, for our uh, audience, summarize your famous acronym steps? How to uh, really be successful? So steps uh, answer the six key drivers uh, of why people talk uh, and why they share. Uh, social currency is the first S. Uh, T is for triggers. Uh, e is for emotion. P is for puck. The second P is practical value, uh, and the second S is stories. Um, and those are the six key drivers of why people talk, why they share, and all sorts of things to catch on, from products, services, to ideas. It's not random luck, chance, why something succeed and others fail. The more we understand the science behind the mouth and social transmission, we can engineer products and services uh, and ideas to be more successful. Okay, thanks a lot. Good uh, and rapid summary. And for sure, uh, we encourage our audience to read the book to know more. You have also a wonderful example which illustrates how to use each of these uh, drivers. Oh, yeah, sure. Definitely, you know, check out my website. There's a whole bunch of resources there with more information about each of the principles and uh, how to apply them. Brilliant. Um, I was. I wanted to uh, to ask you as well. I guess about your your most recent book, uh, The Catalyst, and um, and there, obviously, you outline five factors that impede change and and how to mitigate them. And I guess relevant to what you, for example, that you just gave about you know those businesses, how businesses are adapting the post COVID world and remote working versus versus being back in the office. Um, I guess you know it, it, it would be great to hear your perspectives on that in terms of um, how that that um those factors i guess apply in that in that uh, scenario um you know what are what are the things that are impeding those changes that you mentioned that the the, the ability for us to make those changes that are necessary in the, in the post-covid world you know it, it's been an interesting time to be writing about and thinking about change uh, mm -hmm. obviously we were dealing with an immense amount of change even before covid so you talked about digital transformation and the like and um, uh, you know, I, I wrote the catalyst in part because of having worked with various companies and organizations, 
was they all had the same problem, which is they all had something they wanted to change, right? The marketers and the sales people want to change customer minds, uh, leaders want to transform organizations, startups want to change industries, nonprofits wanted to change the world. But as we all know, change is really hard, right? Often we push, we pressure, we cajole, and nothing happens. Uh, so the question I sort of wondered is, could there be a better way? Could there be a better way to change minds and drive action, not pushing, but by do something else? And that's what the catalyst is all about. It's a different approach to change. It's really about thinking about why people change and why they don't, and how by removing barriers can we make change more, more, more likely. Um, and so it's been a lot of fun working with different companies around this time, uh, both in COVID-related things and otherwise, uh, and think about how to remove barriers to change. Great. And I think uh, one of the things that, uh, that I think... Um... Uh, that, that our, our audience would be really interested to hear, I guess, in your perspective on is, is that in terms of those hurdles to change and removing those barriers, which I guess is, you know, is a, is a really um, important part of everything we do in behavioral science. You know, I guess, you know, the, the, the whole concept of making it easy is about removing removing hurdles to change, isn't it? Um, which of the, those hurdles do you think marketers most commonly fall foul of and, and why do you think that is? Um, you know, I think in marketers in particular, um, mm -hmm. so uh, the Catalyst has a framework called the Reduce Framework. Marketers tend to most prey to the R, which is uh, reactants, right? Um, when we push people, they often push back. They often do the exact opposite of what we want them to do. Uh, when an ad comes on the television, we switch the channel. When, uh, you know, an email comes in from a marketer that we're not expecting, we delete it. Um, uh, you know, we avoid or ignore persuasion attempts to avoid being persuaded. Even more so, we counter-argue. We think about all the reasons why what someone is suggesting is not something we want to do. And so I think marketers' intuition is, well, let's push people more, right? Let's add more facts, more figures, more reasons more information. If I can show them one more ad, they'll come around. And the problem is that doesn't work, right? Uh, because the more we push them, the more they dig their heels in and, and resist. And so really at the core, what we need to do is give them back some agency, allow for agency. We need to stop trying to persuade them and encourage them to persuade themselves. We need to stop trying to sell so much and, and get them to buy in. And so in the book, I talk about a variety of ways uh, to do this from asking rather than telling, um, from uh, you know providing a menu or giving people choice, highlighting a gap between attitudes and actions, a variety of strategies sort of give them back some sense of control or freedom. The more they feel like they're in the driver's seat, the more interested they'll be in, in helping us out. Okay. Jonah, maybe a, a last uh, question. What single piece uh, of advice would you give communicators and marketers to drive lasting change? Yeah, to drive lasting change. I think you need to understand your customer. There's one, one thing, it's understanding your customer. And customer there is in quotes, right? So some of us don't think we have a customer. If I'm a nonprofit and I'm trying to get people to donate money, I don't think I have a customer. I'm not selling anything. Well, but you do have a customer. Your customer is a donor. Um, if you're trying to change behavior within an organization, your employees are your customer. And they're a customer, they're not buying something from you. But if you don't understand them and how they work and why they're not doing what you want them to do in the first place, it's going to be really hard to get them to change. And so it's it's not about um, uh, marketing. It's not about communication. It's about understanding that person or people that you're trying to change or organization that you're trying to change and using that to help make change more, more likely. Okay. Thanks a lot. Bye. What a marathon. <laughs> it's been a long day. Adrian, how are you holding up? <laughs> surviving, surviving. So it's been a really long day, but I hope a very insightful one. So thanks a lot to all of you who've been here with us in Paris. Those, for those of you who have joined us online, I saw from our communications team at one point there were over 2,000 people at one time online. And at some point during the day, well over 3,000 online today. So we have a lot of you to thank for joining us. Do keep filling out the surveys. We are trying to track your emotion. We know emotion is a driver of behavior. So after each session, do join the Human Advantage uh, community so that you can get access to Adrian's sketches. And we will start day two tomorrow, a very promising second day, uh, at 8.45 a.m. here on Paris time, 7.45 in London, um, with a really interesting conversation with Katie Milkman. Um, she is a, another Wharton professor, like, like Jonah Berger, uh, the author of How to Change. Really interesting insights on kind of personal habit change as well as organizational change. So, Eric, a final word. 
No, just to say thanks a lot, and I don't know if you have the video, the join me video uh, by uh, Cathy uh, Mixman. Thanks, we'll see you tomorrow. And I, and I am incredibly excited to see you at the Human Advantage Conference, where we'll be talking about insights from behavioral science that you can apply to your own life to be more productive and to achieve your goals. Hope to see you there. She's very interesting. And maybe last word from me about Adrien. I don't know if it is possible to share some uh, sketch note from uh, Adrien. Good job, Adrien. I think it was uh, very challenging. So do join the community where you can get access to those sketch notes. We know that visual reminders help us retain information. So log in and we will share those with you over the next few days. See you tomorrow. Thank you all. Hope to see you tomorrow.